The world we live in is full of things we don't understand. Being the curious humans that we are, we naturally try to seek those things out. Doing so has led us to remarkable discoveries and inventions that we never could have imagined a hundred years ago. We have defeated disease, built to the sky itself, and even created machines that could take us beyond the clouds and into the stars. If our ancestors could see us and what we have created, I'm sure many of them would see us as gods. Our innate curiosity and lust for knowledge has not always led us to greatness, however. True evil and darkness have also been uncovered in humanity's conquest of knowledge. And in the end, I fear this evil will be our doom. I do not say this from the standpoint of a great philosopher who has sat and simply pondered things either. No, I say this because I have seen it, experienced it. I... I was part of it. The event I'm about to relate to you, it, it's true in its entirety. This I swear. I feel certain that this will fall on deaf ears and many of you will believe this is just another spooky story meant to give you cheap thrills, but I promise you that is neither my intent nor my purpose. The purpose of this story is to simply warn you of what lurks beyond the veil, of what we can see and understand, to show you what awaits us in the darkness. Even if I myself don't understand it. What I am about to tell you has happened and I feel certain it will happen again. In 1971, a not so well-known scientist began preparations for an extremely secretive project known as the Harbinger Experiment. I would like to keep the identity of the scientist a secret for personal reasons. So throughout this re-accounting, I'll refer to him as Zimmerman. Zimmerman's background is unclear at best, beyond 1971. All that is known about him before that time is that he had grown up somewhere in Maryland with a strange fascination of the occult and supernatural. This later made him an outcast among his fellow scientists due to how scoffed upon the metaphysical was and still is at the time. Zimmerman's opinions concerning the otherworldly were not the sole cause of him being an outcast, though, it was his methods that made him widely unaccepted among his peers. Zimmerman was well known during this time for being ruthless and cold beyond measure. He never cared about the means. All that mattered to him was the results. And if he predicted the results to be valuable enough, anything would be worth obtaining them. It was this insane and brutal lust for the truth that made him feared among those who knew him. And the few who knew him did not fear him, believed in him, and followed him and his work very closely. The word Harbinger, itself, such a mysterious and intimidating taste to it. Maybe it's the way it rolls from our tongues, or maybe simply due to the association with the project, but the word always seems to carry a certain amount of doom with it. Which would make sense. The word itself means to warn or forebode. I can't imagine Zimmerman's reason for giving the experiment this title, but in retrospect, it fits perfectly. Zimmerman came to a select few, me being one of them. He told us he was working on something big, 
and he needed people who could keep confidentiality and not spread idle gossip of his work. While he did not fully trust some of us, he did know that we were professionals, and that for some reason or another, we were all in dire need of employment. I had worked at a local clinic as a doctor, but I was caught stealing medication and was promptly fired. This left a very dark mark on my resume, so it was hard for me to find work. I was also a native to Alaska, and lived near where the experiment would take place, so I guess you could say I was a convenient choice. As you can imagine, I jumped at the opportunity. It was hard not to when I saw the payout. Fifteen of us were hired in total. Some were colleagues of his that have been working with him for quite a while. Some were maintenance workers, and a few were hired as private security. I was the only medical professional to be hired. It is still a wonder to me how he even attained the funds necessary for this experiment. I would not be wholly surprised if his financing was not entirely legal. But legal or not, I needed the money, and he was paying. Looking back, it's a dis looking back, it's a decision I have come to regret. After Zimmerman obtained his money, he used it to buy a relatively large plot of land deep in the frozen wilderness of Alaska. And upon that piece of land, Zimmerman built a concrete structure. Not dissimilar to a bunker, in fact. The sole difference being that its goal was to keep any potential damage contained within the structure, rather than keeping it out, as he put it. Most of the structure dug underneath the earth, which had the effect of making the underground complex seem so much smaller than it really was from the outside. As would be expected. There was only one way of entering and leaving the underground structure, and it was via a ladder that led from a small, unassuming concrete building on the surface, which I will refer to from now on as the entrance building, for convenience, to the network below. After everyone had gone to bed at night, the hatch that contained the ladder would be sealed off with a very large and thick metal lid. Zimmerman was very strict about this. Located not too far away from the entrance building was a series of wooden cabins that would serve as the sleeping quarters for the staff Zimmerman had hired. Compared to the entrance building standing on the surface, the underground system was massive. At the center of this complex was a control room. This is where all the facilities, electronics, and such were linked to, this including security cameras, lights, and door controls. Consoles, monitors, and computers lined the walls of this large central chamber. This is also where the ladder in the entrance building connected to, in the underground complex. Connected to the control room were three doors. One led to a small room that served as an infirmary. Another door led to a break room, and the last door led into the hallways. The hallways were where the complex began to feel extremely eerie. They were for some reason laid out in an extremely confusing scheme that led in circles and to complete dead ends. These hallways made a vast majority of the complex, and it would be very easy to get lost in the maze if you were unfamiliar with this complex. But if you knew where you were going you would find yourself standing before one of the three 8 by 8 foot rooms before long. Each room had a camera hooked up to one of the corners in the room, and all three of those cameras were connected to a corresponding monitor in the control room. Cameras were also scattered throughout the hallway so that whoever was watching their corresponding monitor could see anywhere they wanted to when they wanted to. Thick metal doors stood at the entrance of each of the three eight-by-eight-foot rooms. And in order to open them, you would have to enter a four-digit code onto a panel located near the door. 
I remember when I first arrived at that complex. How badly the hallways frightened me. I've always been claustrophobic, you see, and the hallways were so very narrow. The noise, or more accurately, the lack of noise, was also a tremendous source of fear for me in those bleak, narrow hallways. It was always so unnaturally silent, as if the world had stopped moving. It really made you feel like you were trapped down there. Thankfully, though, I only rarely ventured into those hallways, for I was the only medical professional in the facility, and I had virtually no reason to go into them. In the beginning, I found it so particular that Zimmerman would ask for a medical professional like me on a project like this, but by the time it was all over, I understood why. The official purpose of the Harbinger experiment was to test and to observe the effects of extended isolation on the human mind. This is what was listed on the reports being sent out at least. But unbeknownst to all of those who were not participating in the project, excluding the subjects, the true purpose was much darker. Like I said before, Zimmerman had always had an obsession with the occult and supernatural. He sought to prove himself to those who didn't believe him. He wanted physical proof of the supernatural, that it was a real phenomenon. And he wanted to be the first to obtain said proof. The true purpose of the Harbinger experiment was to find proof of the metaphysical. A world that we could not see. The thought of doing this was naturally a tad bit daunting and even scary, but it was Zimmerman's method of doing so that was truly terrifying. Zimmerman believed that he would be able to open a portal between worlds momentarily, allowing three random entities to cross over to our world and each of these beings would be trapped within one of the three rooms. Zimmerman had the theory that any entity would try to latch onto the nearest living thing that had the capacity for it. He wanted to use this technique to trap a spirit in a physical form by allowing it to enter another living being that had been interjected with the compound mixture of Zimmerman's creation. In theory, this compound would keep the entity from simply leaving whatever it was attached to. The only way it would be able to leave the host who had been injected with the compound was through death. According to Zimmerman, the host would have to be something living, with a will strong enough to survive the possession and there was only one known species to possess that amount of will required for this. Humans. Zimmerman had also done something to ensure the entities would only enter the three rooms, and that there would be only one entity in each room. Though I cannot say I know what exactly he did, In fact, I know next to nothing when it comes to Zimmerman and how he managed to do what he did. He liked to keep his methodology a secret to his most trusted. And himself. Most likely due to his paranoia that someone would steal his ideas. And take credit for the success of said ideas. If I had known that this was the true purpose before I signed up, I may have reconsidered. But Zimmerman decided not to tell us until we were all gathered at his fortress. Even if any of us wanted to leave, I doubt we would have been allowed to do so. The security team Zimmerman had hired was loyal to him and the payout. It is not unlikely that Zimmerman had given them the orders to not allow anyone to leave. There were three different subjects 
included in the experiment. All were native to Alaska, and each one was allured into the project under the belief that they would be participating in a harmless study of the effects of isolation on the human mind, as I mentioned before. Which is why none of the subjects objected when they realized that they were going to be confined in one of the three rooms that I mentioned earlier. The first subject was a young man. He was apparently out of work and desperately needed the money that would be offered for participating in the study. The second was a woman. By looking at her, I can tell she was an addict of some sort. The third and final subject was an older man. A drifter, if I had to guess. One thing they all had in common was none of them had any family or friends left. In short, no one would miss them. Which is why they were chosen for the project. I am sorry. I wish I could supply more information about the subjects, but... All of this has been drawn from my memory and I was given very little information on the three to begin with. The experiment did not officially begin until 1987, 16 years after its original announcement. I was eager to begin, so I packed up and headed out to the complex as soon as I could. I arrived at the compound a week before the subjects had even signed up, and a whole month before the project even began. I was not the first to arrive by any means. When I got there, Zimmerman his colleagues, and the security team had already arrived. I suppose you could say I was the first among the people Zimmerman didn't trust to arrive. Everyone had arrived about a week before the experiment began. There was a notable rift between those who were there simply for the money like me and those who were followers of Zimmerman. On October 15th, 1987, all the preparations were in place. The subjects had been sealed in their rooms, the cameras, the lights, and speakers were fully operational, and all the staff members had settled in. The time had come for the experiment to officially begin. Zimmerman asked everyone to report to the control room around 9 p.m. to witness the beginning of the experiment. He wanted everyone to be present when he proved that all his theories had been correct and that he was not just a madman. He wanted us all to see the fruits of his labor. And when everyone had finally gathered in the large control room, Zimmerman turned to us and simply said, Observe. He then turned his back to us, leaned into the microphone that would project his voice through the three rooms and he began chanting in a strange language that I feel certain no one but Zimmerman could understand. We all observed the three large monitors on the wall, silently waiting for something to happen. The subjects all stood in their room, dumbstruck by Zimmerman's chanting, staring at the monitors with confused expressions on their face. After about five minutes, I felt something awful. I cannot explain what exactly it was, but a horrible feeling of dread just washed over me, riddling me with fear. It was then that the ground actually began to shake subtly and the lights began to flicker. Zimmerman continued chanting into the microphone, as if nothing was off or wrong while the subjects began dashing around their room screaming for help. Then suddenly, the ground stopped shaking and the monitor's image turned into static. The air became heavy as we all stared at the monitors, waiting for them to regain their image and show us what was happening or what had happened in those three rooms. For a while, all was silent. But then there was screaming. The screams of a woman going through unbearable pain and terror began to echo through the compound. 
The similar screams of men began to coincide with the woman's terrified screams, and together they mixed into this awful symphony of pain and fear that beat mercilessly into our ears. Those of us who were here for the money began to give each other scared looks, while those loyal to Zimmerman seemed completely unfazed. We wanted to leave and never come back to this awful place, but we all knew deep down Zimmerman would never allow that to happen. We were here for the long haul. There was no escape. It was 10.13 p.m. when the screaming finally stopped. The monitors had yet to reveal to us what had occurred in those three rooms. As soon as the screaming ended, Zimmerman stood and dismissed us all for the night, adding that we were all forbidden to come back to the compound until 10 a.m. tomorrow morning. Not like any of us wanted to. We all solemnly made our way out of the compound and toward the cabins and settled in for the night. I feel it's safe to say that not all of us slept well that night. And I was not one of them. The following morning, all of the staff had arrived at the entrance to the building. We all stood inside, exchanging tired and nervous looks as we awaited for Zimmerman to arrive and open the hatch that concealed the ladder. I can see palpable fear in the eyes of some of us, while others didn't seem to have been even remotely affected by what happened last night. Zinnerman showed up five minutes after ten, apologizing for his tardiness as he came through the door of the entrance building. He opened the hatch and, without any hesitation, began descending down the ladder towards the black abyss. He almost seemed enthusiastic. I was the first to follow behind Zimmerman's dark descent into the facility. It seemed that the farther I climbed down, the more darkness it closed on me, as if it were trying to swallow me whole. And as I climbed deeper, I couldn't help but feel that this place was different somehow. While before there was only the unsettling concrete hallways and rooms, now there was something else. Something made the eeriness feel so real and profound and personified. I felt like a horrible and gruesome scene awaited us down there, but I continued climbing downward, despite my fear and my hesitations. This was no longer just a spooky bunker. There was darkness and malevolence in the air. A true evil now lived here, and I could feel it. We all could. I finally felt my foot touch the ground and let out a slight sigh of relief to be on solid ground. Almost as if on cue, the light bulbs came alive, dousing the room in their warm and welcoming light. Zimmerman must have turned on the power, I thought. I allowed myself to take a couple seconds to examine the control room. It was exactly how we left it last night for which I gave a slight and thankful prayer. It was almost as if nothing unusual had ever happened. I shook myself from my thoughts and I remembered the static-filled monitors from the night before. I let my eyes slowly make their way toward the monitors on the wall, anticipating the grim and fearful scenes that would be on them. My attention was first grabbed by the monitor, 1 and 3, which were still pure static. It would have been a small relief, but then the monitorless image on monitor 2 caught my eye. Room 2 was entirely still, and everything seemed entirely untouched. I couldn't help but gasp as I noticed only thing that was different. The woman lay in the center of the small concrete room. An expression of fear and terror was frozen onto her gaunt face as she lay silent and lifeless on her back. Zimmerman's expression turned angry when he saw this. 
He ordered that the second monitor be turned off, and it was. We didn't ask why. It's not like any of us wanted to see the dreadful scene any longer. He also ordered that if images of the monitors of 1 and 3 did not return within the next two hours, the security team would be sent to investigate the rooms. The security team nodded at hearing this. They made it seem like they had no fear, but I could see it in their eyes. The subtly loud tick-tock of the clock was the only sound that echoed through the control room while I stared at those monitors. An hour and fifty minutes had gone by, and the static was still occupying monitors one and three. All the other staff members were working except me. This was due to the fact that the project had been completely injury-free thus far, so essentially I had nothing to do but wait for someone to hurt themselves. Zimmerman, a couple of his colleagues, and I were the only ones that occupied that room. They quietly chatted amongst each other on the other side of the room while I spent my time reading and pondering the situation I currently found myself in. I had clearly made a mistake coming here. The corpse lying in room two was evidence enough of this. And God only knew what awaited us in rooms one and three. My thoughts were soon interrupted as Monitor 3's image returned. The clear image now displayed on the screen made everyone's eyes noticeably widen. What was displayed on the monitor was horrifying. A humanoid thing stood in the center of the room, staring directly at the camera, unmoving. It was wearing the jumpsuit that the subject was wearing. But this clearly was not the same man that had entered that room. What caught my attention first were its eyes. They were solid black and twice the size of a normal human eye. They seemed so... so endless and cold. Its head had also grown with the eyes in such a symmetrical and unsettling manner. The being had also shed all hair it once had, and even from the monitor I can see how unnaturally smooth and clear its skin was. It had also seemingly grown in height and stature, which could be seen in the fact that the jumpsuit was now obviously far too small for its wearer. Its limbs had grown especially long. Its arms hung almost as low as the creature's knees. What we were looking at was in no way the same man we had sent inside. Fear. Fear was all I felt as I continued to stare into the monitor at this thing in that room. And my fear seemed to be shared to those around me, which made me feel kind of good. It may sound awful, but it was a bit satisfying to see that Zimmerman and his colleagues could feel that fear too. But at the same time, it was worrying because this showed that this was not part of Zimmerman's plan. Something had gone wrong. We all stared into the monitor as the thing, despite our fear, it was almost as if we were in a trance. My already present fear began to grow and spread rapidly throughout my body as I became lost in this creature's eyes, trapped in its terrifyingly hypnotic gaze. After what felt like forever, I managed to break eye contact with the creature and divert my attention from the monitor. And when I did so, I felt my fear levels drop considerably. After a short while, Zimmerman ordered his security team to make their way to Subject 1's door, just as he said he would do. The security team left without question, armed only with batons and pistols. I focused my attention on watching the men progress through the hallways towards Subject 1 rooms, via the cameras. Even through the not-so-high-quality cameras, 
It wasn't hard to tell these men were afraid of what awaited them. Their heads were downcast as they walk. They did not possess the same confidence within them that they did at the beginning of this project. They looked like scared boys being sent off to a terrible war. Eventually, they made it to the door. We had perfect vision of them and the door via the hallway camera. One of them said something through one of their walkie-talkies and made a motion toward the camera. In response, one of Zimmerman's colleagues buzzed the door open. The men already had their pistols out by the time the button was pushed. Slowly, the door began to open. We all watched eagerly as the men began to approach the door, guns aimed inside. Suddenly and without warning, there was a loud shriek. And as something bounded out of the room at the men, the monitor turned into static. Immediately, we can hear screaming echoing down the hallways, followed shortly after by the distinct sound of gunshots. We could do nothing but wait. After a couple of minutes, the screaming and gunshots stopped. We all waited and prayed, hoping that whatever bounded at them from that room would not be the one to return to the control room. After a couple more minutes, three of the men came back. Carrying with them was the corpse of the fourth. He had massive cuts covering his chest and his face was shredded. You couldn't even tell who he was anymore. Or even that he was human. I was used to this gore being a doctor and all, so I felt somewhat unfazed by the mass of shredded flesh and bloodied meat they carried with them. But many of the others went pale and vomited. The security team all wore emotionless expressions and eyes filled with terror. One of the men finally looked up at us. He stared at us for a while with those wide eyes of his. It's dead. He finally managed to mutter in a shaking and scared voice. A couple hours went by. The dead man's name was Frank. He was buried outside in the cold Alaskan ground. Two of the men were unharmed, physically at least. The third was alive, but barely. His body covered in bloody slashes and one of his eyes had been gouged out. I managed to stabilize him, but only just. The other two men vaguely explained what happened. Apparently, Subject One leaped out at Frank after the door had been open. Only it wasn't really Subject One anymore. According to them, it was a hideously contorted face and long, sharp claws. They claimed to have shot it over a dozen times before it fell dead. And then they emptied another dozen bullets just to make sure it was really dead. Only once it was dead did they come back. After tending to the wounded man, I went to investigate the monitors. As afraid as I was of seeing what those monitors may hold, I needed to see. Subject 3 was the only one left now, and I needed to see and make sure that the creature was still in that room. It seemed more like a jail cell than an ordinary room at this point, though, which was probably a good thing. The cameras displaying Subject 1's room and the hallway outside is, is still displayed on a static build screen. No one was sent to repair them or investigate. We just had to hope that Subject 1 was well and truly dead. Monitor 3's image was exactly the same as it had left. Subject 3 was still staring directly into the camera at us. He was still in the exact same position and if it were not for the small fan in the corner of the room, I would think I was looking at a still image. In a way, I felt relief at seeing this. Relieved that he was still in his room and had not escaped while no one was looking. 
After everything quieted down, I noted something especially unusual. There was a strange sound coming from somewhere. At first, it was barely noticeable. The only reason I heard it was because of how extremely quiet it was in the infirmary. But as time went on, it slowly began to increase in volume. After about an hour, it was loud enough that everyone could hear it too. And after a couple more hours, its volume increased so much that we could determine what the noise was. It was a song. One of the staff members identified as Living in the Sunlight by Tiny Tim. Apparently, his father loved the song and listened to it frequently. The song seemed to be on a loop and kept replaying itself. Although we were able to identify the noise, we remained unable to identify the source. We knew that it wasn't coming from the speakers because we had turned them off. It seemed to be emitting from the walls themselves. More time ticked by as we all began to become increasingly agitated by this song. I spent most of my time in the infirmary attending to Frank, or in the control room. Fear hung in the air, and the presence of unmistakable darkness and evil was no doubt its source. Subject 3 still had not moved, and had kept his unblinking gaze fixed on the camera the entire time. I always felt like it was staring directly at me, no matter where I was in the room. I think this effect was also felt by others, due to the fact that they seemed to move around the room a lot, and for seemingly no reason. After a few hours, the song was so loud that people almost had to shout in order to communicate. We had been trying to find its source so that we can turn the song off, but it was to no avail. The source was completely unidentifiable. This added a level of extreme irritation to our already very present fear. It was around 8.30 and the ground itself began to shake once again, just as it had done the previous night. Panic began to spread among my fellow employees and I as the shaking grew intensely. During this, I had the sudden intellectual feeling to look over at Subject 3's monitor. It was gone. Almost as if on cue the power went out, and thankfully the song did as well. Ever since the security team came back, panic had been slowly building up among the staff. And Zimmerman was powerless to stop it. When those lights went out, the calm progressions that everyone had been trying to maintain left us and the fear in our hearts took over. The emergency backup lights kicked on shortly after the power went out, which I gave a slight thankful prayer for. The lights were dim, but they still allowed me to see a lot. A total panic seized us as many of my fellow staff members began screaming and rushing to the ladder in an attempt to escape. But too many were trying to use it at once, and no one was able to get very far on that ladder without someone else pulling them to the floor and taking their place. Zimmerman was shouting for everyone to calm down, but his dominating and intimidating personality had no effect here. And his demands fell on deaf ears. It was total chaos. It wasn't long until people actually started hurting each other in their desperate attempts to get up that ladder. I could only stand against the wall and wait for my opportunity to escape up the ladder. All the screams were soon silenced as the familiar hum of that unsettling song began to rise in volume again, only much quicker this time. And this time, it was clear that the noise was coming directly from the maze-like corridors. People stopped fighting and shouting as all our attention shifted to the door that led to the hallways. The song quickly got louder than it had ever been, which forced many of us to cup our ears with our hands in an attempt to silence the noise. Then suddenly, the sound completely stopped. Silence. 
That was all that filled the room as we all stared at the thick metal door in anticipation for what was coming. It felt like ages had gone by, but in reality it was probably only a few seconds before the silence was broken. The door suddenly and violently burst open and the music started again, louder than it had ever been. The suddenness and the volume of this caused many of us to recoil by falling on the ground and grabbing our ears in an attempt to block out the noise. I glanced up for just a second, and in the doorway stood a tall, smooth-skinned creature with long limbs and eyes so dark and malevolent you could clearly see them in the dim lighting. After I got my bearings, I looked up towards the creature once again, just in time to see the thing pick up and rip Zimmerman in half in one fluid motion, dousing the room and everyone in it with his blood, intestines, and organs. I was no stranger to gore, but the sight of that was too much for me to bear. I hunched over immediately after seeing this and vomited all over the cold cement floor. The latter is my only hope of survival, I thought, as I forced myself to a standing position. As my eyes rose along with the rest of me, I can see the thing ripping and tearing through people as they scatter in an attempt to escape it. It was distracted, and as awful as it sounds, this was my only chance to get up that ladder. I forced my legs to move toward the ladder, trying to block out the terrified screams of my fellow staff members and the unbearably loud music. I can hear gunshots coinciding with screams and terrible sounds of flesh being ripped apart somewhere in the mess of noise. I reached my hands outward as I felt a wave of relief wash over me as my fingertips came in contact with the hard metal rungs of the ladder. I gripped them and began to climb upward as quickly as I could in my disoriented state, all while praying that the monster would not see me and pull me off that ladder back to the slaughter. I felt like at any moment I could feel one of those smooth hands wrap around my ankles and pull me to my death, but eventually I made it to the top. There was no question in my mind. I had to close the hatch and seal that thing down there, even if it meant death for my colleagues. I would not allow that thing to escape. I gripped the thick metal lid and began to push it with all my might in an attempt to seal the underground complex off. Despite how dense and sturdy it was, the lid was surprisingly easy to move and did not take much effort to push over the hatch. Even in my weakened state, in seconds the hatch was completely uncovered by the dense metal lid. I collapsed on my side and began to vomit some more as exhaustion overtook me. And as I lay there realizing something, aside from my labored breaths, the only thing I can hear was the faint echo of that song from down below. I felt as though I would lose more of my sanity if I continued to lay there and listen to that song. So once again I forced myself up to my feet and began to make my way to the wooden lodge I had stayed in the previous night. It was there I had left my baggage, and also where I had left the keys to my truck. Of the 15 staff members that took part in this forsaken experiment, I am the only one who survived. I have never returned to that awful place where all of this happened, and I don't intend to. The project was very secretive, and Zimmerman was the only one who knew all the details of it. And as far as I know, no one's aware of my involvement aside from me. In fact, I'm probably the only one who knows what the Harbinger experiment truly was, let alone what actually happened. By now, you are probably wondering why I have told all of you about something none of you should be aware of. Because you're expecting me to give you a speech about messing with things you don't understand, or something along those lines. I hope not, for I have no speech to give or lesson to impart. I began hearing a noise earlier today. Almost immediately I recognized the noise as a very haunting and familiar song. I didn't even try to trace its source. I knew it would be pointless. 
and as the day progressed, the song has increased in volume. It's loud enough that I can very clearly make out the lyrics. I am completely unable to escape Tiny Tim's voice as it follows me everywhere I have gone. Subject 3 is coming for me, and I know my time left in this world is extremely limited now. I guess you could say I just wanted to tell you the tale of the Harbinger experiment before it was lost forever. I hope that you will take some lesson from what I have recounted to you, but I think we both know you won't. Let's be honest. You don't believe a word of what I've just told you, and I don't blame you. I wouldn't believe me if I were you. To you, it's nothing more than something to get your cheap thrills from. You were probably mindlessly surfing the internet when you clicked on a link and found yourself wherever here you may be reading this story. And to be honest, I don't care if you believe me or not. Even if you do, it probably won't stop you from trying to uncover the truth of the darkness that few of us has ever seen. I certainly never stop Zimmerman. If you want a lesson, look at what happened to him when he went seeking the truth. I pray that none of you will ever have to see the evil I have seen. I hope you all get to live in ignorance of what lies beyond the veil of what we can understand. It's here now. I can feel its black eyes burning into me, just as I could all those years ago. I am as much to blame as Zimmerman is for this monstrosity that is now free to roam the world. Even if I was not the one to create it. I'm sorry. Please, forgive me. Please.